Now, Mendel took all this information, he synthesized it, and tried to come up with something to explain dominance and recessive, to explain this 3 to 1 ratio he sees in the F2 generation every time for each of the seven traits he looked at. And so he came up with two laws that did a pretty good job of explaining genetics as we know it even today. The first one is called the law of segregation. Now I know it sounds kind of weird, we don't normally use segregation very often nowadays, it's become kind of a dirty word, but segregation really just means separation. All right, so don't freak out here. This is just that we are going to separate something. And it just so happens the something that we're separating is going to be the alleles. So what Mendel discovered is that each individual plant had two alleles per characteristic, or I'm going to say per gene, because that's the word that we now use. But he would have said two traits per characteristic. We say two alleles per gene. And so you guys might see this written like here, where you'll write like big A, little a, or big A, big A, or little a, little a. These are our possibilities. So each of these represents an allele. And what Mendel realized is when you have an offspring, you only pass on one of yours. So if you have a big A and a little a, you can only pass on either the big A or the little a. So this is, goes back to meiosis when we talked about that when you do meiosis, the sperm and the ovum only have one set of chromosomes, not two. So you only get one copy, one allele for each gene. The other allele that you'll get that makes you have two again, right, that's going to come from the other parent. One will be from the sperm, you'll get the other one from the ovum. That'll get you back to being 2N, that'll get you back to being normal diploid that we're used to. So this was critical because it meant that when you had these original guys that were breeding, and so we have, let's say, big T, big T, crossed with little t, little t, the big T guy could only give a big T. The little t guy only has two little t's, so he had to give a little t. So all the offspring were big T, little t. This is why all of them were tall. But then after this, and we're going to discuss Punnett squares more in class, it'll just be a way of visualizing how this could work. After this, you now have individuals that are big T, little t. Let me just do this over here. Uh, big T, little t, big T, little t. These are the F1s that can reproduce with one another. So each of them can pass on a big T or a little t. So this allows us to get a lot of different combinations. And so in this case, we can even have this one shot out of four at getting two little t's getting somebody that's going to be short. And so this is why the shorts reappeared in the F2 generation. So this idea of the law of segregation explained all of this wonderfully. Now later on, a guy named Punnett came along and actually came up with a, a square situation here where he just writes out based upon what the alleles the parent has, you can fill out which possible alleles the gametes can have. You know, if I'm big T, little t, I can either pass on a big T to my offspring or little t. And that's what this does is it looks at each parent what their gametes could have. So essentially if we say this is the dad, if this is the male, the sperm can have a big T or a little t. If you say this is the mom, then ultimately that means that her ovum could have a big T or a little t. So this shows us all the possible combinations of the possible gametes. So as I said, we'll go into this more in class as we practice, but that should give you a general idea of not just how to use a Punnett square, but also why Punnett squares are useful. You don't technically have to use one. There are mathematical ways of doing this, but we're going to keep it simple here. Now, some more terminology as we now understand that each individual tends to have two alleles for each gene, and now that we understand that they can look different ways, they can have different traits that they express. So let's dis discuss the proper terms. So we've got genotype is what alleles you possess. So you can have two dominant alleles, which we will call homozygous dominant. Now notice I have to say dominant after homozygous. Homo means the same, so it means they've got the same type of allele, but it could also be homozygous recessive. I wouldn't know if you just say homozygous. All I would know is they're the same, but are they big big or are they little little? So we've got homozygous dominant and recessive, and in between we've got where the alleles are different from each other. And so we call that heterozygous. Hetero meaning different, and we don't have to say heterozygous dominant or recessive typically, it wouldn't matter. Heterozygous means one big, one little, all set. You know, there shouldn't be any ambiguity there where you have to define it further. 
And if you want to abbreviate, I usually use capital HD for homozygous dominant, capital HR for homozygous recessive, and capital H lowercase et would be heterozygous. So if you'd like to shorten your stuff, you're going to see me do this as well, just to keep it simple. Now, this is what their alleles are, but there aren't three different phenotypes. Phenotypes being what you look like, what you express. And so in this case, there's only two ways that the pea plant can look. It can be tall or short. And so it just so happens two of these phenotypes, any of them that have a dominant allele, are going to be tall. So we can see big, 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 small. Don't ask why I use pea. Apparently I was thinking coloration, but I'm going to roll with it. Uh, short then would be homozygous recessive. Uh, this would obviously work the same too if I did it properly with big T, big T, big T, little t, and little t, little t, but we'll use P's because the letters actually don't matter that much. They're just there to convey the idea of dominance where dominance will be uppercase and to convey the idea of recessives where recessives will be lowercase. You'll see in class sometimes I'll actually avoid using certain letters because it's harder to tell if they're upper or lowercase. So I like using ones like A's because they're so easy to distinguish, whereas something like an S can be difficult based upon how you draw it. I don't always know for sure if it's upper or lowercase. So even if we pick something like smooth, you don't have to use an S, even though oftentimes it's used. You could just as easily decide, I want to use Y. As long as you have the idea where uppercase Y is going to be smooth and lowercase Y is going to be constricted, we're okay. You know, they're just representations. They don't actually have some concrete thing where you have to choose it. They're just there to make our lives easier. Now, the law of independent assortment is much tougher. And this is when Mendel took two different traits, like height and flower color, and he crossed both of them. So he basically took a guy, uh, a particular pea plant, that was, let's say, tall with purple flowers, dominant for both traits, and crossed it with one that was short with white flowers, recessive for both traits. And this is what he actually did. And then he got offspring that were once again all dominant, but he wanted to see what happens when he crossed those F1s. He was wondering, am I going to get three individuals that are tall and purple, dominant for both, and one that is white and uh, short, which is going to be recessive for both? Or am I going to get something else different? So when Mendel went through and crossed things and he looked at height, and so we'll say tall and purple, short and white, uh, so when he went and crossed these guys, he was thinking originally that he would get this three to one ratio. So three of them would be tall and purple for every one that would be short and white. And what instead he found when he crossed these is there were nine individuals that were dominant for both traits, tall and purple. There were three individuals that were tall, which is dominant, but they had purple flowers. So they were recessive for that one. There were also three individuals for every 16 that were going to be short with purple flowers. So once again, recessive for one trait, dominant for the other. And there was only one individual out of every 16 that was actually recessive for both. So he got this other magic ratio, not three to one this time, but nine to three to three to one. And the reason this is so significant is it showed that what you get for one trait doesn't affect what you get for the other. So essentially when you're going through and dividing up the alleles for tall, it doesn't impact what you get for flower color. So being tall doesn't make you more likely to have purple flowers than being short does. You know, being tall is a separate choice or a separate event than having purple flowers. And we call this independent assortment. Otherwise, if you don't have independent assortment, what we should see is we should see tr the traits tend to travel in pairs. So you would see that pretty much all the tall individuals should also have some other trait. They should also have purple flowers, or they should have green pods, or they should have smooth pods, or whatever. But we should see this connection. We don't. And so that's the importance of the law of independent assortment. One gene, one characteristic, does not affect what you get for another. Now, because what you get for one trait does not affect what you get for another, we get this fun idea of recombination that we talked about in meiosis, because pretty much all of Mendel's stuff goes back to meiosis. So we have independent assortment that goes on during meiosis when you get either mom's or dad's chromosome for each type of chromosome. And so this allows us, we talked about, to get a lot of variety. And so this allows for these new combinations. It allows for the offspring to look different than the parent. The parent still had to have the alleles but the alleles could be recessive and masked. 
you know, you can have new combinations of alleles that you get in the offspring, and that's perfectly acceptable. And based upon how much you have genetically going on, you can get lots of fun combinations. So if you're looking at independent assortment, we said there's two possibilities for each. You can get moms or dads, right? There's two possible alleles that can be passed on. Because we have 23 chromosomes, we set how it's 2 to the 23rd power, or about 8 million combinations from that alone. And so this idea of independent assortment that's behind genetics does give us a tremendous wealth of possibilities. But you do still have to have the traits in the family. If no one in the family has a trait for, let's say, blonde hair, assuming it's as simple as one allele for blonde hair, boom. So if no one has the allele for blonde hair, then there should be no way that that ever crops up unless there's a brand new mutation. It's just not going to happen. However, if several people have blonde hair alleles that are recessively lying in wait, it is possible that every now and again, poof, up pops an individual that has blonde hair. Or in the case of peas, poof, up pops an individual that happens to have green peas, which is recessive, or happens to have white flowers, or be short, or happens to have constricted pods, or whatever else you want to go with. All of those would be legitimate.